Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We're in a series here called Back to the Basics. We're studying doctrine. We're studying what we believe. And today's topic is, what is the church? What is the church? What is the church? And we happen to be sitting in a building that we call the church. If someone asks you, hey, what are you doing Sunday morning? I'm going to church. And there's even, take me to church. You know. So what is the church? Here at Family Church, we define the church as the community of all true believers for all time. The community of all true believers for all time. Now, this may seem strange. For all time, what does that mean? It means past, present, future. Past, present, future. We're talking about the church. We're talking about anyone who's ever put their faith in God, even those who put their faith in God before Jesus Christ died on the cross. We're going to get into that in a minute. Most of us, when we think of church, we think of fancy buildings. We think either of stained glass and cobblestone, or we think of uh, traditional contemporary church, or maybe you think of something like this here, which we would consider a modern church, LED walls, moving lights, and haze machines. But biblically speaking, the church is more than just a building. There's even an entire theological study on the church, and it's called ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the church, and this word ecclesiology comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Anybody ever heard that word before? Ekklesia. Ekklesia basically is in reference to the church. It means a gathering or assembling together. And let's admit that Ecclesia has taken some damage the last couple years uh, just by disease and pandemic. The gathering of people together has somewhat dismantled in the United States. But we have to look at the fact that when the term Ecclesia was used, there was no church buildings like there were today. Not in the sense that we're sitting here right now. Yes, we had temple, but the worship at temple looked very different than what we're doing here today. The first century Christians were often persecuted, therefore many of them met in secret gatherings in homes. When you go and look at many stories of the Bible and where you found them having church, it was at someone's house. In fact, one of the most popular stories, because we think it's just so cool, is that there was a paralyzed guy, and his friends wanted to get him to Jesus, and they couldn't get him to Jesus, so they ripped the roof off this guy's house to drop him down into Jesus. Like, That's the coolest thing. I just tell you, you get up on my roof and start ripping off shingles, there's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> but it's so cool because it was someone else's house getting destroyed to get a healing. But it was in a house. And when after Jesus died, the disciples are hiding out because they think that they're next, where does Jesus find them? In a house. But as the influence of Christianity spread, eventually buildings were dedicated to the worship of Christ, and that's what we call churches or church buildings today. And I will say that that is a struggle in some churches, that as they grow numerically with their congregation, they have to then build a building. But then so much focus goes on to building the building and having it right and having the, the, the paint just right that the focus becomes the building and not the people. It's a struggle. In a sense then, church is not a building but a people, correct? So we would, should, can consider ourselves the church today. 
Fellowship, worship, and ministry are conducted by people, not buildings. Church structures facilitate the role of God's people, but it does not fulfill it. Very, listen, can, can we be honest on this? Very little ministry actually happens in the church. Can we just point it out? First service, did a salvation call. There was 287 people in first service in seats. Four people gave their life to Christ. Four out of 287 is not a lot of ministry. That's not a huge percentage. Get it? Now, was I ministering? Was I teaching the word of God? Yes. But that's not a lot of ministry. That's one person doing something. Could you imagine now those 287 people mobilizing into their community, doing ministry? Now the church has some power and some influence. The church is a people, not a building. Ephesians 5.25 pretty much makes this kind of clear. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ did not die for a building. And I know that some churches have crosses on the front of them. I think this one does. Yeah, this building does. But Christ didn't die for this building. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to give my life so they could have an LED wall. <laughs> no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for a building. No, that's ridiculous. It's the people in the building. Christ loves you so much that he gave his life for you and for me because the church is a people. Okay. And Christ didn't just die. Now, this is where it's going to mess you up. Christ didn't just die for all those who would believe in him in the future. He died for those who already had died in faith, never receiving the promise. You got to read the Bible on this one, okay? Back in the day before the cross, when Christians or believers died, they would go to what's called Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus died on the cross, his spirit went down into hell. It went into Hades, made a spectacle of Satan openly, jumped over to Abraham's bosom, and led all of those who had died in faith free to heaven. So, so he, he not only died for the church that was to come, but for the church that already was. That's powerful. And Jesus said that he would build his church. And I told first service this in utter transparency, and there was a lot of people who really believed that when I'm about to share what I'm about to share, uh, they, they, they think that I'm now going to hell and that God is uh, very upset at me. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, 18, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A couple weeks ago, I'm driving home from Oklahoma. Uh, I had a 14-hour stretch that I was just completely by myself. And I began to think about that verse. And I got a little annoyed with Jesus. I got a little bothered with Jesus. I said, Jesus, you said that you would build your church. And I feel like I'm doing all the hard work. You ever work with somebody? They're like, hey, man, can you, like, help me do something on my house? And you get there, and they know nothing. And then they do nothing, and you carry in four two-by-fours into their house, and they're just sitting there like, oh, that looks heavy. <laughs> yeah, like, go get some, bro. And I was, I'm being transparent and honest. I feel like the last two years, I'm like, Jesus, I'm doing a lot of lifting here. I'm doing a lot of work. I'm doing a lot of carrying. When are you going to do some building? Now, see, I told you, you're going to get quiet because you're all, like, concerned that, like, lightning bolts are going to come from heaven. <laughs> it's all right. God's got big shoulders. He can handle tough conversations. All right? And it's my own frustration. But look what he says. He says it to, to, to um, Peter. 
He says, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, I tell you, you are Petra, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I kind of realized that the reason why building the church can be so hard sometimes is because we're not all doing our part. We're not all doing our part. Anybody ever worked out in the gym? Bench press. Anybody ever done bench press? Yes? You ever, done, you ever spotted somebody who thinks they can lift more weight than they can actually lift? Nah, put 300 on. Put 300. Like, you, like bro, 300 is heavy. Nah, nah, put 300 on. And now they kind of pull it off and they go down and you're spotting them and you realize like you're trying to deadlift 300 pounds because they ain't picking up any of it. <laughs> you're like, push, 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 you push, you push, push. <laughs> That's what it can be like sometimes in the church when some people are doing their call into ministry and they're doing what God has said and then there's others who are just like, I come to church to watch the show. That's a problem. Because churches cannot be full of consumers. Church cannot be full of consumers. Church must be full of prosumers. Prosumers. People who not only consume the product, but sell the product. You gotta be a user of the product. You gotta tell other people about the product or else this thing doesn't go. Like, think about it. Jesus said, I'm gonna move out to this little pedestal. This is for Christmas. He says, I will build my church. How is he doing that? He's doing it through you. But if you don't let him do it through you, Guess what? It ain't going to move very fast. It ain't going to move very fast with people who aren't moving at his speed. Okay. You see, we have this physical church, but we also have an invisible church. There's this invisible church that's all about our hearts. How do you know that someone's actually saved? Someone's actually a Christian? I'm a Christian. Why, how are you a Christian? Like, how are you a Christian? Well, what do you mean? I got a Christian t-shirt. I got a fish sticker in my car. What makes you a Christian? Right? The condition of your heart makes you a Christian. What you believe in your heart makes you a Christian. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are his. He's the only one that can see the heart. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I just want to ask you today, what's the condition of your heart? Let's first talk physically. Most of us never get our hearts checked until there's a problem. Until our arm is numb, or you drop to the floor, or your blood pressure is way off. Then all of a sudden, you will pay any amount of money to get your heart better. But we didn't care at all about the condition of our heart until it was a heart problem. In the metaphysical, it's the same for most of us. We don't really ever monitor our spiritual heart until there's a problem, until we behave in a way that's unlike us. I don't know where that came from. I don't know why I did that. I thought I was over that. I thought I had conquered that in my life. Now that something happens, there's this bad situation, now it's like, you know what? Maybe I should check up on my relationship with God. Maybe I should see where my heart is at. See, because we can't see that. And, and a lot of times we don't monitor the thing that we can't see. That's why it's so great that God can, that God is there. And it is God's job to oversee and maintain the invisible church in our hearts. But there is a visible church that is ours to maintain. We 
are the church and we are to maintain our light. We are to maintain our influence in the world. The visible church contains genuine believers along with those who do not yet believe. I want to take a moment. First service was the first time that I've ever preached this passage this way before. But in this passage, I want to point out four types of people that should be in every healthy church. And as I begin to read this, you're going to be like, that doesn't seem like that's very healthy, but it'll come together at the end, okay? This is called the parable of the sower sows the word. And at the end of the parable of the sower sows the word, Jesus then explains it. And this is Luke 8, 11 through 15. Now the parable is this, Jesus said. The seed is the word of God. So what's the seed? Okay, so you are receiving the word of God today. I am preaching the word of God. So this is happening right now. The word of God is going out like seed being thrown on the ground, okay? The one that falls along the path are those who heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and they are not saved. Okay, they did not what? Believe and they are not. This is a non-Christian, okay? Number two, group number two. Then those on the rocks, those are one that they heard the word, they received it with joy, they believed in Jesus, they accepted him as their Lord and Savior, but they have no roots. They believed for a while, and in a time of testing, they fall away. Group number two. Group number three. As for those that fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Fourth group are those of good soil. They're the ones who hear the word, hold fast to it, and who have an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with patience. Four types of people. And unfortunately, that last one, which we're going to call mature believers, probably only makes up less than 5% of the church today. This isn't shade. This isn't shame. But let's just look at facts. People hate when I talk facts because we are such emotional people. We think so highly of ourselves emotionally that we can't even look at facts. If the church that we had built for the last 4,000 years was so spiritually mature, the church would not have crumbled so fast during the pandemic. Fact. Just fact. I don't know a church in New York that is back to half of its capacity that it was before, pre-pandemic. Where's all the mature believers? I'm saying they're sitting in church today. There's a lot of people who were involved in churches for, for, for generations, for decades, not going to church today. So you can't be a mature believer if you fell away. Okay, okay, okay. Let's look at these four types of people, four groups of people, ready? The first one, this is the ones the seed fell along the path. This is the searching group. These are people who are looking for their faith. They're looking for their truth. They said, I've gone to a lot of churches. I, I'm, I've been on a lot of vacations. There's this void in my life, and I'm trying to figure out what it is. For them, we offer our weekend service. We offer our weekend experience. We offer community outreach to go reach them. These people never got saved. They are not following Jesus they're searching. I love this group of people. I do. This group of people should, in a healthy church, make up almost 20% of your numbers. Think about this. Wait, you want a bunch of non-saved people at your church? How's the church going to grow if no one comes to hear it? If no one's seeking you out, right? There's this big debate. Is your church attractional or missional? I said both. Well, I'm not about that. Listen, 
yes, we have haze machines and LED wall and moving headlights and loud music and all that kind of stuff. It's attractive, but I'm, I can't attach you and motivate you if I don't attract you. Okay, but we want to be missional as well. The searching group, there needs to be a healthy number of people in your church that do not believe. And guess what? It's not just my job to convince them. It's everybody in here. It's everybody in here's job to convince the unbeliever to believe. Okay, number two. This is the group where the seed falls on the rocks. These are new believers. They just got saved. They just got what? They're saved. They got saved. They received the word with joy, the Bible says. They got saved. They believed in Jesus. But during a test of time of testing, they fell away. You see this in church all the time, man. People come in, they, they meet Jesus, they get on fire, and all of a sudden they disappear. And you're like, yo, what's up? You know, I got something going on with my family. I got a new job. And my dog died. Whatever. Things happen in life. And they just stop going to church. It doesn't mean they stopped believing. Dear God, how like egocentric are pastors to think that if people stop going to your church, they hate Jesus. That's not the truth. Sometimes life happens. What does this group of people need in order to gel and connect to the ecclesia more? Relationships. Building healthy relationships. We believe, this is one of our cultural phrases, we believe that life change happens in the context of relationships. You've got to make friends. You've got to make healthy Christian friends that are pushing you and promoting you to be the best that God has made you to be. Will we all be perfect? Dear God, I could probably mess you up more than I could help you. <laughs> right? I mean, that's how we all are. We all have our issues and our problems. I'm going to throw this out there. The other day, I got bored. I needed, some, I needed a break. I couldn't write. So I went down to PJ Park. I got in the tractor, and I began clearing and cutting down trees, and I mowed a 200-yard area and started to set up an archery range. To bow and arrow archery range. Is there anybody in here who shoots archery? A couple of you, a couple of you, right? Male and female, don't matter. All right, by the end of today, I will have an archery group on the church website that you can join and you can come down and shoot archery with me. I love all things outdoors, fishing, hunting, hiking, outdoor stuff. You want to do archery? Join my archery group, come hang out. You want to learn how to do archery? Go get a bow, come down, we'll teach you how to do archery. Look, that easy to build relationships. Find some other people that enjoy doing what you do and invite them. Invite them, right? People will help support what they help create. So create a group. Ask people to come help you create a group. Make friends. And this is what then happens. When that testing comes to that new believer, they don't fall away because they have a friend to grab onto. Hey, man, I know that we were shooting bows on Saturday. I didn't see you in church on Sunday. Everything all right? Yeah, you know, things got you know, a little crazy this weekend. I got a little busy. All right, am I going to see you next week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No pressure. I can't control you. It's relationship. Group number three. This is the one where the seed fell on thorns. This is called the growing believer. The growing believer is going to experience some thorns, man. It's going to be a little painful sometimes as you grow. They pass some tests. They're growing in their faith, but they get busy. The world distracts them. They are not fully mature in their walk with Christ. They're still a Christian, but they're still dealing with life. They're trying to grow. Here's what that group needs. That group needs to discover their purpose. 
They need to discover their purpose. They need to discover their personality. They need to take a personality test, a spiritual gifts test, a five-fold ministry test. What, what do I have to offer other people? How can I be a leader? How can I influence others? They need to be growing. Maybe they need to join our college and get systematic training. They need to grow, growing believer, which would then lead them to the fourth category. The Bible talks about seed on good soil. This is a mature believer, a mature believer. They have the correct heart, and they are producing fruit. They are producing fruit fruit. Their job is to impact the world, to start leading, to jump into our leadership pipeline. Maybe they need to take fam foundations, fam life leadership, fam life leadership too. Maybe they need to jump into our college, to get involved in our internship program. This is the mature believer saying, there's more to my life than just consuming a Sunday sermon. I need to give back. I need to be teaching and training others. If you're taking notes, write this down. Maturity is not about how much you know. K-N-O-W. Maturity is not about how much you know. It's about how much you go. And it's not even about how much you grow. It's go. What are you doing with what you know? Man, everybody knows sugar's killing us. Everybody knows it. Every single one of us knows donuts are bad for us. Every single one of us knows Dunkin' Donuts is bad for us and that McDonald's, we all know it. We all know that we should go to the gym for 60 minutes a day. But going is a different story. Actually doing what we know we should be doing is a different story, isn't it? So it's not about what you know. You may know everything that that buff dude at the gym knows. You know it all. You know the technique to lift. You know that you have to squeeze your packs. But you don't do it. So guess what? You look like me. <laughs> Once was something. Now you're nothing. Right? So the question is, what's the church supposed to do? What's the church supposed to do? What does it look like to be the church. One of the things it looks like, and Paul encourages us in Colossians 3.16, is to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. Now, I gotta tell you, please don't invite me over to your house for dinner and then pull out your acoustic guitar and say, hey, we're just gonna have a time of worship. <laughs> That's uncomfortable. <laughs> That's uncomfortable. Like, I don't like, I don't really like that kind of stuff, right? Like, Maybe if we were like in a campfire and it's dark and the only thing we can see from each other's face because of the campfire and then someone brings out a guitar, that might be kind of cool. What this is talking about is you being the church. Is there a song on your heart? You ask my staff, they'll catch me in the hallway walking down singing a song at the top of my lungs in the hallway. I'm not saying, hey, everybody, come together, come together. You got to hear me. You got to hear me sing a song. That's not what this is talking about. The church should be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in your heart to the Lord. Worship in the church is not merely preparation for something else. It's not just that. It, in and of itself, is fulfilling a major purpose of the church. Like Chris's job, Pastor Chris's job, is to not get everybody ready for the big show. That's not the purpose here. The purpose of worship is for us to say, you know what? This has been kind of a crummy week. I need to shake this off. I need to stop thinking about me and I need to think about God. And sing a song to the Lord. The next step, the next thing the church is supposed to do is to grow believers. Grow in our faith. Look at this. We're charged again in Colossians 1.28. Present everyone mature in Christ. That the church's job is to lead, instruct, and grow each Christian so that they're presented to God mature in Christ. Dude, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Especially for people who know what to do and don't do it. 
if, God, if Jesus, listen, this is no pow pow, like I'm not really trying to down here, I'm just being facts. If, if Jesus is going to build his church through you, then you've got to like work with him on that. There might be someone that he wants to touch through you in your life, through your example. Here at Family Church, we have four things that we are always doing. Four steps in this maturity process of what we're called to do. It aligns with these first four. Ready? It's this. We want to see the lost saved. The lost saved. Every sing, almost every single Sunday, we try to do a salvation call. Again, how funny would it be to keep doing salvation calls if there's no unsaved people in your church? We want to see the lost saved. Secondly, we want to see the saved pastored. The saved pastored. Who is giving you word? Who is speaking into your life? As much as I love the fact that we can reach thousands of people on the internet every single week, it's very hard to pastor you when you're not here. It's very hard to pastor people that I never see. Come on, somebody. We want to see the saved pastored. Are you getting good word that's changing your life? The lost saved, the saved pastored. Step three, the pastored discipled. A consistent, systematic discipleship. Are you learning what you need to learn? Do you know what you believe? Discipleship. For what end? Disciples sent. The law saved. The saved pastored. The pastor discipled. The discipled sent. Are you going into all the world? Are you being a light to those around you? I'm going to ask you today, what stage are you at? What stage are you at? Are you the lost that needs to get saved? Are you the saved that needs to get pastored? Are you the pastor that needs to get discipled? Or are you at the point now where it's like, I need to make a difference in my world. I need to impact those around me. I need to go. I need to be sent. I need, I need to speak in front of other people. I need to present my ideas. I don't know where you are in your journey with God. But Family Church can help you get there. We can take one step together. One step in your walk of faith. Maybe for some of you, you need the Acts 1-8 experience. He says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses in both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Maybe you need that power experience. Well, you know what? Maybe come out fan prayer on Saturday and get that power experience. Maybe that's your next step of faith. But I'm going to take a second. I'm going to talk to that first group, the lost saved. You've been searching. What's my truth? Is God real? Does he even hear me? Does he even care? Maybe you've been looking that there's like this void in you and you've been trying to fill it and find what that meaning is. Maybe lately you've just been questioning life. Is there even any purpose for life? Maybe for someone in here today, the only thing that's keeping you here is your kids. I'm alive for them. There's more purpose than that. There's more purpose than that. But you've got to find it in Christ. You've got to find it in your creator. Only your creator can tell you what the creation was made for. I was writing this little mini book called A Wasted Life. I think there's a lot of us that wasted a life. We've been that person who hid the talent in the ground and did nothing with it. And part of our confusion with a wasted life is questioning who created us. If your mom and dad created you, if that's what your belief is, mom and dad created me, then your mom and dad have to tell you what they created you for. And we're in a society today where it's like, I'm not going to tell my kids what they're supposed to do. I'm going to let them figure it out for themselves. Well, stupid, that's why we're not going anywhere. Dumb, don't make kids if you don't have a reason for making kids. But if God created you, God created you, then God needs to tell you what he made you for. 
That means you got to take some time to hear him. That means you got to take some time to meet him. That means you got to take some time to get away, disconnect, and say, God, creator of the heavens and the earth, you created me. You saw me in my mother's womb. You formed my innermost being. What am I supposed to do in this life? But you can't get there. You can't hear that voice unless you call upon his name. If you're in here today or you're watching online and you've never taken that first step of faith, the lost saved. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord unto salvation, I want to offer that to you today. And how we do that here is we pray a prayer of salvation. The Bible says believe in your heart. Remember, only God sees the heart. Believe in your heart and then you say what you believe with your mouth. I believe Jesus is Lord and I'm going to say that with my mouth. And because we love you here at Family Church, we want to say that prayer out loud together. Says, Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.